Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of Revit Pure Live. I am Nicolas Quetelier, an architect, BIM specialist, educator, and founder of the website RevitPure.com. I am based in Quebec City, Canada. Uh, Revit Pure Live is a show where we help you become a better Revit user. Sometimes the show is done by myself, but sometimes guests come on the show to share their knowledge. Today, it is the case with the guest I'll soon be uh, introducing. Before we get going the show, I have a couple of things to share. Um, the first is about the Rivet Pure pamphlets. Pamphlets have been published four times a year uh, since 2016. There are now 19 pamphlets available for you and they are all free. Each pamphlet covers a different Revit topic and the goal is always to make uh, each topic simple for you. Uh, so if you go to revitpr.com slash pamphlets, or you can find the link in the description, uh, you scroll down and here you will see the entire pamphlet collection. So uh, whatever your skill or specialty is, architecture, uh, mechanical engineer, uh, structure, client, whatever, you will probably find something that will be helpful to you. So again, that's all free. Just go to revitpr.com slash pamphlet and uh, you will find the link then to download the zip file that contains the entire pamphlet collection. Um, all right, just give me a sec here. Okay, and I'm also ready to announce the next episode. The next episode will be a solo episode where I'll be all by myself. It will be on Wednesday, April 21st at 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, and during this show, I will help you create beautiful views in Revit. As you might know, before being a BIM specialist, I am an architect and design nerd. Uh, I love creating beautiful presentation documents. So this episode will be dedicated uh, to creating great presentation views using Revit. And with simple tips, you can apply right away to your projects. If you're one of these people uh, who complains that drawings made in Revit are ugly, which I often hear, uh, make sure to check out the next episode. Uh, so today's guest is Michael Kilkelly. Uh, Michael is an architect, design technologist, and writer based in Connecticut. Michael worked for Frank Gehry and Partners for seven years before starting his own practice called Space Command. He's also running the Art Smarter website, where he teaches uh, architects about automation mostly. So welcome to the show, Michael. Thanks, Nicholas. Great to be here. Great to see you. So have you been, you've been busy in the recent months? What are you? Uh, yeah, it's been busy. Uh, a lot of automation projects as, as it would happen, which is appropriate given our, our topic tonight. So mm -hmm. yeah. doing a lot of uh, custom tools specifically for Revit, um, you know, just looking at different workflows, different ways to automate tasks. So it's, uh, yeah, it's been really interesting. So good stuff so far. And you've been running Art Smarter for a while, right? When did you start? Uh, let's see. I mean, I started working for myself, um, in 2012. So that's when yeah. I was, uh, at Frank Gehry's office for seven years mm -hmm. from 2005 to 2012, and then, um, moved back to the East coast and, and in 2012 and have been sort of doing that ever since. So, um, trained as an architect, but as I, I moved, I still do an occasional architecture project, but mm -hmm. for the most part now it's really on the technology side, consulting side. Yeah, sure. So what projects have you been working on at Gary's? It's kind of a Yeah, um, interesting. I worked, on, I worked on a lot that never actually got built. I'd oh, really? OK. The biggest ones, though, um, I worked on the the Beekman Tower, which is also right now called Gary by um, New York by Gary, which is a high rise in lower Manhattan. I worked for a long time and I've actually continued to work on it as a consultant on the uh, Guggenheim Abu Dhabi project. Oh, OK. Has stopped and started construction a number of times, but I think it's I think it's starting for real now. So that's been a long that's been a long project. <clears throat> and what have you been helping them with? Is it modeling geometry or more getting no. the the BIM content? Yeah, it's it varies between mm -hmm. um, doing BIM specific things or uh, I worked well. I worked there. They actually weren't using Revit, so we were doing a lot of AutoCAD and using um, Digital Project, which is a version of Katia. Uh, so most of what I do for them is is automation. Sometimes it's automating AutoCAD. Uh, sometimes it's automating Revit. Depends on 
the project, um, but mostly, you know, looking for ways to be more efficient. And I mean, those projects are so big. It's yeah. like any, you know, any little thing you can do to help sure. shave off a couple minutes here and there uh, adds up. Over they, the they add up. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, uh, so when did you start to get interested in automation? Is that something you've always been interested in or? I. Uh, it started actually while I was at Gary's office because, um, and it was born out of necessity. So mm -hmm. I was, you know, I was the guy who kind of packaged the drawings up at the end. Um, that was my role, like organizing the data, organizing the drawing set. Uh, and I was working on a project. Um, it was the Brooklyn Arena in New York, um, which we ended up, we got fired from, which is a long story, but I won't get into that. <laughs> okay. But, uh, um, at the time, though, we were talking, you know, it was going to be potentially seven buildings, a basketball arena. It was a huge project. And we had, you know, a really tight schedule, lots of deadlines. And um, for me, it was just brutal. Like we would finish, you know, 70 hour week and then I'd have to spend another eight to 10 hours just getting the drawing set packaged up, getting mm -hmm. everything sent out to the owner, uh, to the contractor. And so from there, it was like, you know, we one of those times where we had just a, a brutal week and then everybody left to go celebrate the deadline and I had to stick around and you know, do another eight, eight hours of work oh. on top of that. So I started learning how to use um, Visual Basic or VBA for AutoCAD and just writing these really bad scripts to just automate a lot of the, the tasks that I had to do. And so over time, I just, you know, it was I had tried to learn programming before and I just mm -hmm. could never do it. I, I took a class in grad school uh, and it just almost buried me because, uh, you know, it was just too difficult. Yeah, but I think you, you need a task, right? You, you need, need an, task, an actual exactly. project. If yeah. you just try to learn a programming, but you don't, it's, you don't it, have no need for it, you know, it's right. pretty hard. It is hard. And, and because there is a, it's a different mindset and a different mentality that's required. And so in order to get up, up that learning curve, um, you need to be motivated. And for me, I was really motivated because I didn't want to be spending, you know, eight hours uh, extra mm -hmm. on a Friday night. Mm -hmm. uh, thing. So um, that was kind of the, the first taste of it. And then, you know, from there, the programming is such a, a deep topic. So going from real simple the VBA scripts in AutoCAD, mm -hmm. uh, moving into um, vb.net scripts and revit mm -hmm. and now c sharp which we're going to look at today mm -hmm. um, and so you know i've been i'd say programming in revit for eight years like full time more or less for about four you know mm -hmm. and i feel like i'm just i'm just getting started like i'm i'm sort of yeah. scratching the surface um because there's just you know so much you can do and, and so many different technologies um, so it's it's interesting in that regard all right. So b before jumping in, in, into Revit, uh, I guess a question that is common, I think you actually have, have a course about that is, uh, so should you go with Dynamo or should you go with uh, coding? Um, it's a really good question. And I would say, like when I started learning um, Revit programming, Dynamo wasn't out or it was just coming out, but it wasn't wasn't particularly useful. I think mm -hmm. Dynamo is a great way to get started. Um, mm -hmm. It's a great way to get get your feet wet and to learn to start thinking computationally, because uh, you are you know in Dynamo you're working with the Revit API. You're mm -hmm. just using nodes rather than typing things out in code. Yeah, um, sure. And so I think it's it's a good way because you'll see a lot of commonalities and it makes the the jump if you want to make that jump to programming a lot easier because you have some familiarity and you're you know and I I do think your thought process changes as you start you know, programming, whether it's through Dynamo or it's through, you know, Visual Studio and actually coding. So that is a lot, um, that helps out a lot. Uh, I did it backwards, I learned to code and then I went back to oh, okay. Dynamo and, you know, now I'll go back and forth depending on on what the need is. Um, yeah, so, so, so you think it, Dynamo is almost kind of a gateway into programming. It is, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, that, you know, some things though are easier in Dynamo. Some things are easier to do it in coding. Yeah, it, and it depends. And perhaps you know people in our industry, especially architects, tend to be extremely visual. So perhaps you know yeah. Dynamo might be helpful for them to get started. Right. And if your end goal is you know do you want to make a tool that you're going to use mm -hmm. yourself to to help you out on your project, Dynamo is great. If you're trying to develop you know a suite of tools that your entire office is going to use. Mm -hmm. You can certainly do Dynamo, but you're going to run into issues. Um, and 
and I guess final question before we get uh, going. So, uh, why do you use uh, C sharp instead of uh, Python, for example? Uh, well, for add on, like with add in programming, mm -hmm. um, there's so much more support for mm -hmm. C sharp. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned I started using VB.NET uh, just because I knew VBA and it was an easy transition. But a lot of the code samples and examples out there are in C sharp. Um, there's not all that much out there for Python. Mm -hmm. And the implementation, um, you can do it like PyRevit is all in Python. Mm -hmm. um, but if you look at, they're using a thing called um, Iron Python, which mm -hmm. emulates Python inside of um, sort of the .NET framework. Um, it requires a lot of work to, mm -hmm. to do that. Um, Python is also not, it's not a compiled language. It, uh, so it would run slower than a C sharp. Oh, okay. Because okay. it's, it's running it at, at real time. It's reading it as a script file, as opposed to a DLL, which, and, and we'll look at that in a second, but, um, when you compile your code, it's going to run a lot faster. Um, so I, I'm interested in Python. I use Python when I'm in, I, um, Dynamo, you know, and if I get, if I need to do something mm -hmm. custom, I'm by no means, uh, a Python pro, um, but when it comes to you know making add-ins, there's just so much more support for C and, Sharp. And would you say most plugins or add-ins in uh, Revit are made using C Sharp? Are, yes. Are, yeah. are someone are some people still using uh, VBNet? They may be. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. um, it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell on the, on the outside. Like I can't. You can't necessarily. Other mm -hmm. than if you knew, know the programmer, I would imagine though. Um, most programmers are using C Sharp. Okay. All right. So the table is set. So I'll be jumping to uh, your screen so you can okay. uh, start to, uh, to share with us. All right. So we good to go, Nicholas? Yeah, go All ahead. Right, thanks. Yeah, we can see um, your screen. Again, so what we're going to look at today is your first Revit add-in. So I'm going to walk you through the process of writing an add-in. And we're going to do, you know, we're going to start at the basics. We're going to build from there. And first of all, let's just talk a little bit about what is an add-in. I think we all we all use them. We all know what they are, but what we you know what are they really? So anytime we extend or build something custom on top of another piece of software, that's what we would call an add-in, or sometimes it's referred to a plugin. But we're taking the core set of functionality and we're expanding it through use of the software's API. So any Revit add-in is built on using the Revit API. API stands for Application Programming Interface. And Revit's API first came out in 2005. So when the software uh, first started, you know, way back in 2000, the intent was to never have an API. And the developers, the original developers were like, we're gonna provide you all the tools you need. You don't need to make your own tools, you know, don't worry about it. And so over time they said, well, maybe, you know, maybe we don't wanna develop all the tools maybe there are some custom applications. So the API was first introduced in 2005 and every subsequent release, like with you know 2022, the API gets improved. So what's interesting for a long time, up until the release of 2022, you couldn't make a ceiling in Revit through the API. Like there are no Dynamo nodes. Yeah, it. I just saw that, that it's, yeah. now, uh, it's just now been added, just right? Just now, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you think from 2005 to 2021, like we are now, you could never make a ceiling. So now you can. So the the API gets like it evolves and it grows um, over time, and things change too. Like certain, they rework the way things are structured. Um, you know, there's always like new features or new releases that come out as part of the API. Now, an add-in obviously is going to be accessible through the parent software. So you can't, you know, I'm not going to have an add-in. Uh, that I launch from outside of Revit necessarily. You know, that's that's kind of a different animal. So what we're going to look at today, let me pull it up, is I've done a an add-in called our Revit Pure Live. So we have a cool. Revit Pure Live add-in. And we're going to be going through this. I want to show you how it works first. Um, and then we're going to replicate the steps to actually build it. So this is a pretty simple add-in. Um, I have four buttons up here. And... All they're going to do is they're going to change text in text note to uppercase or to lowercase. So I can click on this button and you'll see it just changes the text right there. And I can go 
to lowercase, and then it changes it back to lowercase. If I want to do a particular view, I can do that as well. Instead of changing all the text, uh, every single text node in the drawing, I can just change this text in the current view to upper. If I go into another, another view, I can see that the text here is still set to lowercase. So pretty straightforward, but if you've ever worked in a project where somebody, you know, doesn't follow the office BIM standards and they kind of do things on their own and they're like, oh, I don't really like the way that uppercase text look, you know, and then you have to go in and fix it. Like these things are, are super tedious to do manually. I would hate to have to do that manually, but they're real easy to do um, as an add-in or through Dynamo. Yeah, so, I'm sure everybody has, you know, a list of tasks they've been doing list. and oh yes. my God, this is so boring. I wish I could automate oh, yeah. it. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. And I mean, those are always the good projects too, to if you're looking to get started, take something like that, uh, take something that's, that's frustrating. Um, that just takes a lot of time and it's very repetitive. Um, those types of things are ripe for automation. So this is our, this is our goal here today. We're going to look at how, what we need to do to make an add-in like that. Um, but before we start coding, let's just talk about the way that add-ins are structured. So add-ins typically have two files. There is a DLL file and a DLL is like a driver file. It's, it's a compiled code file. And then the other file is a dot add-in file. So a dot add-in file is a manifest. When Revit launches, it looks in specific locations for these dot add-in files. And the add-in file tells Revit where to look for the DLL, and then what code to execute as part of the that DLL. So Revit, uh, Revit is always looking for these. And there's typically two locations where you find them. So you can have kind of your personal, I guess, um, add-ins, which are in your, your app data roaming Autodesk Revit add-ins folder. And let me, I'll pull up mine right here. So. Let me uh, go back for one second. Yeah, I'll just go right here. So this is my my app data folder. So you can see I have a lot of Revit versions here, but uh, you can see that there's a, a folder for every particular version. And if I go into 2021, I can see a whole bunch of DLL files. And then I can also see a bunch of add-in files right here. So if I open up the add-in file, I'm going to just edit it real quick. I can see uh, some, it's XML text um, and it's saying it's identifying the DLL file right here and then a particular class to load inside of that DLL file. And you'll see it, it also lists here uh, the building coder and uh, the building coder website, which is a great resource if you ever go or are interested in coding. Um, they also provide a template file you can use to actually write your own add-ins. I'm going to show you that. And that's where all of this sort of boilerplate text comes from. Um, so that's one location. Now, the other location you can find add-ins is, let's go, in your program data folder. So program data is going to be anything. These are typically, if you're downloading add-ins off of like the, the Autodesk App Store, you'll find a lot of these add-ins get saved into here, or if they're even like Autodesk specific ones. So these aren't particular to the user. These are particular to all of the users. And you can see the same thing here. Um, you'll see a lot of add-in files. So add-in files can also point to other folder locations for DLLs. So you're not, they don't necessarily have to be organized in the same place. But that's typically where these files are going to reside. Now, there are three types of Revit add-ins. Uh, the first type is a command add-in, and that's accessible through add-ins external commands. So let me see, generally speaking, I don't have any here. I'm in my uh, Revit 2021, I go to add-ins, and if I had a command add-in, I would see a button here that says external commands, and I could click that down, and then I could choose from external commands right there. Now, the second type is what we have here with our Revit Pure Live, it's an application add-in. So the difference between the two is that 
Again, command add-ins are only accessible through external commands. Um, application add-ins is where I start to modify the ribbon and I can add buttons and things like that. Now, what's interesting is an application add-in is going to execute a command add-in. So anytime I click any of these, where is my Revit? Any of these buttons, it's actually executing a command add-in. So you'll see once we start building our add-in, the relationship between the two. I usually will start, if I'm working on an add-in, I will start as a command because I don't want to have to actually go through the trouble to build buttons and all that on the interface. And then once I have the actual tool working, then I'll start working to add it to the ribbon. Um, I'll start adding buttons. There's a lot you can do just here as far as the user interface goes to add drop downs, split buttons, all sorts of things. So, all right. Uh, so do you have a, a couple of minutes for questions? Please. So yeah. uh, I do have a question of my own. Is, is it possible with uh, to create your own tab? Like yes. right now you would see it, they're uh, located in add-ins, but you could yep. create your own, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. You can okay. see some of them here. Uh, this, I have a client that I work okay. with. And I, that's, that's, these are add-ins I've developed for them that reside <clears throat> under their own tab. Yep. All right. And looking at the other questions, would like to understand the threshold of time commitment for programming the add-in versus time to complete tedious task. Well, that, that would depend yeah. on the task, but you know, maybe your first add-in, you're not gonna, it's gonna, not going to be efficient to get back all your time, but then it's yep. skill that you will learn for the next add-in, right? Yeah, there's, um, um, let me see if I can find it. Uh, there's a there's a cartoon that mm -hmm. I really like. Yeah, here it is, that I use all the time. It's called, Is It Worth the Time? Mm -hmm. So how long can you work on making a routine task more efficient before you're spending more time than you save? And I think that's the that's the gist of the question. Mm -hmm. So how much time do you, is it going to save you and how how much do you, how many times do you do the task? And I think mm -hmm. there's another dimension that's not here is also how many people are doing that same task. So mm -hmm. if you're thinking about, you know, making an add-in or a tool for your office, there's 50 people that are using it. It's going to, they're doing that task five times a day. It's going to save them five seconds, you know, 12 hours times 50. Like you've got to think of it in, in those terms. Um, you certainly want, you don't want to spend, you know, spend more time than you're going to save because mm -hmm. it's just not smart. Um, I would argue though, sometimes, you know, it's more fun. It may yeah, be yeah, sure, yeah. a little more interesting. Yeah. But, you're proud of yourself when it's yeah, done. You and did it, works. it works. Yeah. Right. Um, but certainly I think, you know, do that calculation and determine whether it does make good sense. Um, certainly too, the more people that are going to use it, the more sense it makes because it just, you know, it, it's going to save you a ton of time in the long run. And Tom asks, uh, do you build these in Revit using Sharp Develop or outside Revit using no, Visual so Studio? Sharp Develop is a is Revit's macro editing mm -hmm. software. So mm -hmm. it, it is built in. If I go to manage, mm -hmm. I can go to macro manager mm -hmm. and I can create a macro. And that's how I got started. I mm -hmm. was just using macros. Um, what I've found though is like, like macros are great because that, coding environment is built right into Revit. The problem is if you want to share those macros, um, they're embedded into the RVT file. And mm -hmm. that means you have to open up that RVT file to run the macros. Um, and that's not always convenient. And I get a lot of questions like, oh, how can I copy a macro? Uh, you can do it, but it's not easy. And mm -hmm. it, it's really messy. Um, also, Sharp Develop is we're not very stable. Um, I can't tell you the number of times that it's crashed on me and okay, I like, yeah. haven't actually saved the file and I've lost time. Mm -hmm. So within the last couple of years, I've been skipping that step altogether and I've been going right to Visual Studio. Um, it, there's a little bit more setup that's required, but it a lot, it's a better environment to work from um, because it's, it's a lot more stable. Um, uh, and there's other tools you can use. Okay you as part of it uh scholar dx asks if rivet api version if rivet api version specific can you do one and then replicate across multiple version or each version is specific it so yes and no um each version of revit has its own api file uh and it has its own api files that you like that it needs to access uh that said 
the API doesn't move and doesn't change that much. So for example, like I've, I have my own add-in um, uh, right here, smart pack. Um, and this is built as a single DLL that mm -hmm. gets used by all the various 2018 through 2021. Um, there are, you could run into issues though, where something may change in say Revit 2020. Um, and so, you know, then you have to start creating specific versions um, for that are that are that cater to that particular version of Revit. Mm -hmm. The way that I do things now is um, I actually create what's called a shared project, and then I link that shared project into specific versions for each Revit version. So I have I write the code once, and then I connect that code to a Revit 2018 version, 19, 20, and 21. Um, and that's a little bit more advanced. There's a lot of different ways you can deal with it. Um, you know, that's something that I've, I've been doing recently. Mm -hmm. But in, what that gives me is the flexibility of, if there's something that's different, let's say in Revit 2022, I can address that in the code so that if I'm building the add-in for Revit 2022, I can use, you know, this code instead of that code. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can make kind of adjustments in there, but I'm only writing the code once. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah, so the things like that come up quickly because you're like, oh, I want, you know, I need to support all of these versions. Mm -hmm. uh, how am I going to do it and, and stay sane, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, we think about, like, I'll show you once we get into Visual Studio, we have our project browser here in Revit. We have the same thing in Visual Studio, but instead of views, we have, you know, different code files. Um, and so you can see pretty easily, there's a lot of things that go into creating an add-in. We're going to have forms, we're going to have different classes, um, you know, and we may have different projects, like sub-projects in there as well. Um, so it, it, it is, if you think about like Revit is, it's, is a very deep piece of software. Um, Visual Studio is very similar in that regard. Cool. All right. I'll keep you going. Yeah, so let's jump into, um, actually, no, let me switch back to see if there's any. Oh, I didn't mention the third type of um, uh, Revit add-in, which is a database add-in. And to be honest, uh, I've never actually created one of these. So the, the idea behind them is that they don't provide any interaction with the user interface. They just interact with like the underlying data inside of Revit. I don't know how they work because I've never actually made one. but. It's there if you ever need it. Um, so we have done that. That's kind of our background. Let's talk about what you need to get started. And what we're going to be using is called Microsoft Visual Studio Community version. Um, it's a free download. Let me show you right here. You can just go to visualstudio.microsoft.com slash downloads, uh, and you'll see community right here is free. That's all I use. I've never been tempted to get the professional tool, uh, partly because I'm developing uh, add-ins mostly, you know, by myself or with maybe one other person. So I don't need all of, you know, the professional or enterprise level tools. Community works great. So that's the the first thing. And then the other thing I mentioned were the the Revit add-in templates. So these are maintained by Jem uh, Jeremy Tamek. Jeremy Tamek works for Autodesk, and he um, runs a blog called The Building Coder. And he is the guy as far as uh, if I have a question or a problem, I'll go to his website to see, you know, what he thinks about that. So he writes regularly about the Revit API, um, all things related to coding inside of the Autodesk um, universe. But he's put together these Visual Studio uh, add-in wizards, they're called. And they're great because it's a template. And what it does is it just provides a lot of the, the startup files that you need to get going. So if I... Um, and you, if you just do a, if you Google Revit, uh, Revit add-in wizard, you can find a link to where you can actually get these files. Um, the templates themselves, it ends up being a zip file and there's a specific location in Visual Studio where you copy it. So if I hop into Visual Studio right here, um, so again, I'm in 2019 community, I can just click on create a new project and I'll get a list of templates that I have. So I want to make a Revit 2021 add-in. And again, this is using the um, Revit add-in wizard template. 
So I've just downloaded it, uh, installed it in the right location, and then I can just click here to actually create it. So I'm going to give it a name and we'll call it live. Um, it's going to save it onto my local computer and that's it. I can click on create and this is going to launch Visual Studio. Now, while that's going on, just a couple of other things um, to look at as far as references. So there's really two things you need to know about writing add-ins. Uh, one of them is you need to know how to use C uh, Sharp. So the, the programming language C Sharp, there is, as you can imagine, there's tons of resources there. When I was making my transition to VB.net to C Sharp, I bought this book, Learn C Sharp in One Day. Um, and it's, it's actually really good. It's not very thick. Uh, I wouldn't say I learned it in a day, um, but you know, I, I came pretty good. I came, I came along pretty quickly. So I think this is a great resource again, cause it's, it's short and it can get you up and started with the basics of, you know, variables and, and methods and naming things. And I still, there are certain things about C Sharp I don't remember. So I always pull this book out, you know, if it's something uh, switch statements, I always forget how to do those. So I'll pull that out and it just makes it easy to go through. So I really recommend that as a resource. Now the Revit API is the other piece. So, you know, it's if you want to create a wall, how do you create a wall inside the Revit API? Um, and there is a site here called revitapidocs.com. And this is all of the Revit API documentation. Now, uh, a caveat is that like the Revit API, um, it's really, can be really dense and it can be a bit uh, intimidating when you first start out. So I, I, always say it's like it's not a travel book it's much more of like a roadmap so it's not going to tell you about it you know in beautiful po prose how to create a wall it's going to show you the very specific commands you need so if i search for wall.create here um i can i didn't get it is it let's see walls let's look there all class um this is kind of what you're looking at you know it's very technical it's going to tell you uh, you know, the nuts and bolts about the wall class inside of Revit. And so I can look at wall methods and I can look at how to create a wall. Uh, so this is not a great resource to learn how to program Revit, but as you get more um, sophisticated, as you get more experience, like when I started, I would just Google, you know, Revit API wall create. Because uh, I didn't want to go through the API documents. They were just, they're too much. Now, you know, I'm at a point where I can go straight to the API documents because I'm much more familiar with them. So again, I don't recommend this as a place to start, um, but at some point you will probably end up here. I'm but, looking at, at the top of the web page and it seems there's uh, even uh, releases for each patches, like point 0.1 and yeah. Point 0.2. Yeah, they'll add some additional uh, API functionality for those as well. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. Just like sometimes they'll sneak in, you know, sneak in a feature or two mm -hmm. in those, those uh, dot releases, they'll do the same. With so, you. for example, the, the new ceilings creation, they're not available in any of these. They're just available no. the, the 20, 2022. 2022, uh -huh. exactly. Right, so, okay. if you wanted to make an add in that created ceilings, you could only make that for 2022. Mm -hmm. That None of that functionality is available. Um, and another good tool to get is this Revit Lookup. Um, this is super useful. You can go, if you do a Google search for uh, Revit Lookup Boost Your BIM, this it's another tool that Jeremy Tamek de developed out of Autodesk. Um, but Boost Your BIM um, is a great site because they put it into an easy to install package. So you can just download the actual, the MSI, the installer, and you can install it real easy. What um, Revit Lookup does is it will allow you to look at any element in your model through the lens of the Revit API. And so if you're trying to figure out what something is named or like, uh, I want, you know, I want to change the height of a wall through the API, I can look it up to see exactly what that parameter is. So um, this is another really good, this is useful too if you're working in Dynamo, just because it gives you that very particular way to look at things. So let me switch back into, uh, let's see. Visual Studio, here's our file over here. So I created that new file and you can see Visual Studio, um, 
there's not all that much to it. On the left-hand side, this is my solution explorer. It's kind of like my, my uh, project browser. Um, this is my code window right here in the middle. And then I have a properties window on the right-hand side. And then I have this kind of information window right down here. So because I'm using one of these Revit added wizard templates, it comes with a lot of stuff already set up. So I can go ahead and you can see that there's an app file right here. And I have a command file right here. And there's already some code that's in there. If I go into references, I can see that it's already referencing the Revit API, basically the DLL files for the Revit API. And because I'm using the Revit 2021 uh, template, it's referencing the Revit 2021 DLL files. Uh, so that's helpful. And if I go into click on properties, there's a couple of things in here, uh, again, that are useful. It should pull up in a second. Oh, there it is. Uh, so this is just telling me about the application name. Um, when I click on build, I can select the platform. I'm going to set this to be 64-bit. Uh, For the most part, we're going to be using 64-bit. I have what are called build events. And again, this is why this uh, template is really useful. The build events, what it will do is when I actually build my code. So I write my code, you know, I make sure there are no errors, and then I build it. And what that does is it compiles that code into a DLL file. So when I do that, that's going to execute these build events, and it's going to copy my .addin file and my DLL file into that Revit add-in location. So then I can just launch Revit and I can test it out from there. Uh, so that's helpful. Otherwise, I would need to manually copy those files over. It's kind of a pain if you're testing things out back and forth. And then also, lastly, I have this debug setting. So I can debug my code, meaning I can kind of test it out. And when I click on debug, which we'll do in a second, it's going to launch Revit 2021. And then because I have my build events, it's going to copy my DLL files right over into uh, the correct location. So all that makes the, the process a lot better. Any kind of coding is going to be iterative. So I'm going to, I'm going to do something and then I'm going to test it. Does it work? Yes or no. And I'm going to do something again and on and on. So all of this again is set up as part of this add-in wizard. So now if we want to actually do something useful, I'm going to go over into my command class and let me zoom in a little bit here. You can see that there's already some code uh, set up for me. I'm going to not deal with any of this. So I'm going to delete this real quick. And instead, what we have is um, this is called a method right here, public result execute. And this is when I run a command add in, this is the, the method that Revit's going to execute. So it's going to provide me with, um, it's going to run the method and then these elements inside the parentheses are called arguments. So when Revit executes the command, it's going to provide um, these arguments to it. So it's going to provide this command data, uh, a message, and then if I have anything selected. So below this is I'm setting up some variables. So I have a variable that controls or basically captures the Revit application. I have another one that captures the active document inside of Revit. Um, and then I have one that gets the, the general application state and then the general document state. So these are things that I'm going to be uh, working with. And it kind of answers the question like, okay, all right, Revit, what file, you know, are we working on? Well, that's going to be this one right here. So whatever is the current application inside of Revit, that's the file that my add-in is going to operate. If I switch to another document, you know, that's the file that this add-in is going to operate. So I'm able to specify which file I'm working on through this document variable. Now, if we want to do something real simple, if we just want to test this out, I'm just going to use what's called a task dialog. And I'm going to use the dot show method. Task dialog, all it does is it pops up a dialog box. So I start typing and you'll notice that Visual Studio is kind of trying to figure out what I'm doing and it's giving me some clues. So this is called IntelliSense. So as I start typing task dialog, it's giving me a little bit of information about this, that method, that command. So it tells me um, that I have three different ways I can use it. And it says I, can, I need to provide a, a string, which is a piece of text, um, 
and I need to in provide another piece of text that has the instructions. Like, what is the name of this dialog box? And then also, what is this dialog box going to say? So I'm just going to give it the name is going to be test. And because it's a string, I put it in quotes. I do a comma because this is another, basically another argument that I'm providing. And then in quotes again, I say, let's say, uh, hello, Revit Pure Live. Uh, usually it's a uh, hello word. What, what yeah, we'll do something a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yep. yeah, sure. So I'm putting all of that inside of parentheses. And because I'm using C Sharp, I'm going to do a semicolon at the end. And that just tells that tells the compiler that 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 line is over, that line is done. So, okay. you know, not very exciting, but I have, you know, a program now, an add-in that I can test out. And basically, you've just added, uh, used a template from uh, Jeremy, who works yeah. for Autodesk, and you've yep. just put in this uh, test dialogue show. Everything else was already in the template, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All I did was added this line right here. Yeah, so I have Revit open. I'm actually going to close this. Um, and what we'll do is we're going to launch, we're going to run this um, add-in straight through. We're going to open up Revit straight through Visual Studio. So I can just click on this start button. And what that's going to do is it will debug. It will run this add-in in debug mode. So I click on that. It's going to basically compile the code. And then it's going to copy it over to the add-in location. And it's going to launch Revit for me. Now, this is one thing that's different with macros because macros are built into Revit. I don't have to launch Revit every single time. Um, and you can see, so it's telling me this add-in's not verified. That's fine. I know I wrote it, so I know I'm okay. I can click on always load. Yeah, I guess most people are familiar with this pop-up yes, and usually exactly. click all, always load. Always load, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. So uh, we'll let that add in and we'll let it load up. And what we'll see is this is actually going to show up as a command add-in. Um, and it's a good time while it's loading to take a sip of water. Okay, so we're back in Revit. I'm going to click here to open the file. And now, once that pulls up, I have a license expiring. Um, I'm going to go to add-ins. And I'm going to go to external tools. And you can see here is my command Revit Pure Live. So, and we'll look at this. And I'll show you exactly you know, where this is getting specified. I can click on that. And then it tells me, hello, Revit Pure Live. So that is the command add-in right there. Previously, I didn't have any command add-ins. So this external tools actually didn't show up. So again, I can just keep clicking on that, You know, not doing anything good, but uh, that's still executing that DLL file that we just created. So I can either close, um, I can close Revit or I can go back to Visual Studio and I can hit this stop button. Now, when I'm in this mode here, I can't make any changes to the code because Visual Studio compiled it. So it's kind of like it's frozen at this moment until I hit stop. And that's going to close Revit in the background. And now I can go back to writing my code. So if we look at this, our add-in file here, and again, that's coming straight from the template, you can see that there's actually two entries in here. One is type command. And what this is doing is it's loading the Revit Pure Live DLL, and then it's executing Revit Pure Live dot command, which is this file right here. So there's a direct relationship between what I'm seeing in this add-in file, and then these files here that are my code files in Visual Studio. So I can change the name of this, you know, to whatever I want, and that's what will show up as part of that uh, that external command. Now, if we want to do something a little bit more useful, I'm going to comment out um, that task dialog. And in C sharp, I, if I do two of those forward slashes or backslashes, I always get two forward slashes. I think um, that's a comment, and that just anything that has those those marks before it doesn't get compiled. So this is a good way if you have code that's not working, I can comment it out. Or if, if I want to leave notes to myself and tell myself what I'm doing, um, I can do that just using comments. And so they always uh, show up in the green like this, right? Exactly. Yeah, green. that's, yeah. Yeah, and in uh, Python comments are uh, number signs. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, like every language has their own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's an apostrophe in BB.net. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we've we've demonstrated that it actually works. We can make something. We can do our hello world or our hello Revit pure. Um, <clears throat> let's do something that's a little bit more useful. So we're going to just build very quickly our um, command that will turn all of our text notes to upper or lower case. And to do that, the first thing I need to do, if we think about this logically, is we first need to get all of those text notes in the model. And Revit, the Revit API has a really easy way to do this, and it's called a filtered element collector. So anytime I'm in C Sharp, what I need to do is first declare a variable, and I declare the type of variable. So I'm going to type filtered element collector. And you can see, again, IntelliSense is trying to figure out what I'm doing, so it pops that up. So I can just hit tab to select it. And then I'm going to give this thing a name. So I'll call it text note collector. And you can name things whatever you want. There's really no sort of right or wrong way. Um, Now, my variable is text note collector. And I'm going to set it equal to a new filtered element collector. And to create the filtered element collector, I need to specify which document. So which Revit file are we going to filter? And I have a variable already as part of the template right here. And this is going to be my current document. So I can just use that variable doc. And what that will do is it's going to filter uh, the filtered element. It's going to filter that current document. So I've created the filter. Next, I need to tell it what to filter. So I'm going to go text note collector again, dot of category. And the category I'm going to specify is a built-in category. And I'm just hitting tab to make the selection from IntelliSense. Uh, The built-in category is OST underscore text notes. So these are all Revit's built-in categories. If you've used Dynamo and you've used the select all elements of category, this is basically what you're doing. We're doing it in code. Dynamo, you use the all elements of category and then the categories node. But essentially what you're creating there in Dynamo is a filtered element collector. So here I'm making the collector. I'm saying I want to use the uh, built-in category OST underscore text notes. And that's telling me that it's telling the filter, okay, use the current document and give me all the text notes. And lastly, I want to say text note collector uh, where element is not element type. So when I get all the text notes, it's also going to get the text note types as well. So I don't want the text note types. I just want the text as it's written. So that's all I'm doing three lines here. And that's going to give me all of the text notes in my current model. If I want to test this out, I can do a task dialog and we'll call this test. And then we're going to output like how many text notes are we finding? I can say, uh, text note collector dot get element count. And because you'll see, I'm, I'm doing a lot of periods. There's a lot of parentheses in here. Um, the text note collector dot get element count is going to just give me a number. It's going to tell me how many elements there are because it's a number. I can't use it. Like it's like it's a piece of text. I have to actually convert it into text. So C sharp is really like any programming language is super literal. Like it's a number. You can't use a number in a sentence unless you convert it, you know, to a something that represents text. So I have to. Yeah, use, it's similar in Dynamo, right? Where yeah, exact you same need thing. To fit the, the right wires yeah. into the right boxes. Right. right yeah, you, you can't put a number into a text input. It's mm-hmm. the exact same thing. Um, so let's say now I can do a plus sign because I'm going to concatenate some things. I'm going to say uh, element count. Uh, let's see, text notes found. And we'll close that right there. So that'll pop up whenever you know I run that. It'll tell me, okay, we're getting X number of text notes. So once I've done that, and I know we're we're probably I'm gonna move along quickly, um, so we can get to the good part. And you can see actually how it kind of all comes together. Um, so we'll we'll I won't run this uh, as a debug right now. Let's get a little bit further along. So now that I have basically my collector, so I have a bucket filled with text notes that we got from the model. What I want to do is I want to actually, I want to iterate through them. So I want to 
loop through all of those text notes and we're gonna change them, we're gonna transform them. So I'm gonna use what's called a for each, it's a for each loop. So, and again, I, I like using analogies. So a for each is like, essentially I have my bucket. I'm gonna take a thing out of the bucket. I'm gonna look at it. I'm gonna do something to it. And then I'm gonna toss it away. And I'm gonna reach in the bucket again and do it. And this is uh, one of the big differences between Dynamo and coding is that Dynamo is very much list-based where you're taking a list of things and you're shoving it through a node and you're getting another list of things on the other end and then you're doing something with that. So you're, it's more like an assembly line where you're moving data through this, like you're moving data through each station of the assembly line. With code, typically you're dealing with loops. So I'm gonna get one object, I'm gonna do something, a whole bunch of things to it, and then I'm gonna get the next thing and I'm gonna do a whole bunch of things. So this was the biggest struggle for me when I went to using Dynamo, I had to change that mentality of being list-based and operating on lists and nested lists and, and all that good stuff. Um, coming from something where it's loop, where I can just deal with one individual thing um, and, and deal with that as opposed to dealing with an entire list of things. And it's a subtle difference, but you'll see um, in this case, I could do like 10 or 15 different things to that text note in one loop and then move on to the next one and the next one. So it's it again is a different way to think about things than I would in Dynamo. So I'm gonna create this for each loop, uh, for each I'm gonna do, I have to identify a temp, like a variable. So our text note here. So I'm creating a temporary variable for that thing that I take out of my bucket of text notes. So for each text note, and I'll just give it a name, uh, car note in, and then I specify um, my list, my bucket, text note collector. Oops. The other thing when you program too, you realize um, how bad your spelling is <laughs> and how bad a typer you are. So, um, and once more, C sharp is very literal. So I have a lowercase text note that's different from an uppercase text note. So it gives me that red squiggly line here because um, it's telling me that it's it's incorrect. So if I look down here at the bottom, this is my error window and it tells me the name text note collector does not exist. That's because it's lowercase text note collector. And then that error goes away. So the error messages are, are gonna happen. I'm gonna see them as I'm coding. And then, you know, ideally I wanna fix them right there. So right now I'm looping through my all of my text notes. And if I want to change my text note, I can I can do that and it's actually quite easy. So I'm gonna say car note and that is my current text note dot text. So that is the text property of my current text note is equal to car note dot text dot to upper. So I'm using this property call I'm using this method called to upper to change my text to uppercase. And that's it. So I'm saying the, the same text that you have in that text note, we're not changing it. We're just going to use this to upper to make everything go uppercase. And that's like, that's all I need to do, except for one, one very important thing. But essentially, that's all I'm doing right here is I'm just going to loop through all of those items and then just change that text to upper. I could do the same thing and I could use a dot to lower as well depending on you know, how I want to create the tool. So we'll go to upper because it's a little bit more fun. Now, the last thing I need to do is I need to actually create what's called a transaction. Um, and this threw me for a loop when I first started writing macros and add-ins is that um, Revit needs to lock the model down whenever you make a change to it. Dynamo handles this on its own. It handles it sort of behind the scenes but when I'm writing code, I actually need to create a transaction. The transaction is going to lock the model and then it's going to make the change. Then it will, then I commit those changes to the model. So I'm going to do that by creating a transaction variable and I'll call it car trans. I'm going to set it equal to a new transaction and I need to tell which document, which model I want to lock. So doc. And I need to give this transaction a name <clears throat> to upper. 
So what I've done right now is I've created a lock. And now I'm going to start that lock. So as soon as this code gets executed, the model is locked. I'm going to make changes to the model right here. And then at the very end, I'm going to commit those changes. And then I'm going to get rid of the lock. I'll dispose. So if I don't do this, I don't, I don't get any errors. Everything looks OK. When I go to run that add-in, I'm going to get an error inside of Revit telling me that I'm trying to modify the model outside of a transaction. So again, anytime I'm, any change I'm making, if I'm renaming a view, if I'm adding a wall, in this case, I'm changing the text, I have to have it within this transaction right here. So now I have my code. I can go ahead. I'm going to click on Start. And we'll do our debug. So it will take a second to get started. And we're going to always load here. Probably the worst part, the, my least favorite part about writing uh, add-ins using Visual Studio is just waiting for Revit to start. Yeah. <laughs> it's usually when I like, I'll pick up my phone and I'm like, <laughs> you know, because, Who knows what? Then like 10 minutes later, I'm like, oh, yeah. Because it has to, to close down uh, each time? It does. Yeah, yeah. OK. Yeah. And I, that's why, I mean, macros are better. Dynamo works better in that regard. Um, but in both the macros and Dynamo, like Dynamo crashes, and it takes yeah. everything out. So, yeah. um, so I guess while it's loading, maybe we can jump into a couple of questions. Coward sure. DX uh, says, uh, how do you add images or symbols with the LO Revit Pure Live? Yep, um, I will show you that I in one second. That, we'll right. talk, yeah, we'll and, talk about that. I'll, and he I'll, says, I'll can you add timers as well to get people to stop working? Uh, <laughs> um, you can do timers. Yeah, absolutely. Like you can, with add-ins, you can have um, types of add-ins and processes that run in the background. So you can you can have things that as soon as you launch Revit, it will start. Um, and it will continuously run in the background. And so you could, as soon as that add-in starts, you could launch a timer and then, you know, that would pop up, let's say, you know, after two hours, you want somebody to stop and take a break or at a certain time of day, you want it, you know, to do something. You can build mm -hmm. those sorts of things right in. And yeah. the last uh, question, or it's more a comment, I think, from Erwin. He asks, uh, Visual Lisp, Dynamo rules with slow compiling and reloading and developer never come into the flow. Well, I'm not sure what that means. Um, I think when, yeah, I mean, like Visual Lisp for AutoCAD uh, mm -hmm. and then Dynamo too, like they're they're not compiled. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So they, if this is the gist of the question, that they do execute much more slowly oh, okay, okay. Than, uh, yeah. than a compiled add-in does. Um, I've done kind of testing with, uh, you know, somebody had a Dynamo script that worked, but they were doing it on a huge model and it was taking like six, seven, eight hours really? to actually wow. run through. Um, so I did a, you know, an add-in and it, it ended up doing all that processing in like 30 minutes or so. So the, you know, the time savings can be pretty considerable. So, all right. Uh, yeah, I'll let you go ahead so we don't yeah. go too overboard with time. Yeah, so I'm going to go over to add-ins again. I'm, again, we have this set up as a command add-in. Now I can just click on uh, Revit Pure Live here. And you remember we set up our task dialog. So it's telling me that there's 17 text notes that are found in the entire model. And I can click close. And then it's going to run and it executes that to upper. Cool. So I'm going to undo this. And let's see, is it going to let me? Uh, see. Uh, it didn't show it. But typically, when you do undo, um, it will show you the name of the transaction that you created. Okay. So every transaction you create ends up being an undo item in the model. Now, one other thing I can do because I'm running this in debug mode is I can create a breakpoint. So I'm going to just click, oh, let's click right here. And I'm going to split my screen. And we can get rid of this. So now when I go to execute my command add-in, you can see that the add-in is executing the code as I go through. So it's stopping where I put that breakpoint. So now I can press, I'm just pressing F10, and it's stepping through the code 
line by line. And what's useful, I'm down here at this bottom window and I'm in the locals tab and I can see these variables get filled as I go. So we're gonna get our task dialog, uh, 17 text notes. So here's our transaction getting created. And now I will see that right here at the bottom, here is my transaction object. So I can, I can interrogate it, I can look and see what's actually inside of it. Same thing as I go through our, our text note uh, for each loop, I can see here's my temporary uh, car note variable. So I can look at that current <clears throat> note and then I can see all of the various properties for it. You know, we think text notes are pretty simple, but when you look at them through the API, like there's a ton of data that's contained in them, none of which, you know, we are ever really exposed to because we're dealing with it graphically. What's the style? Mm -hmm. Where is it located? You know, what's the actual text say? So I can go through this and I can just loop through all this code. You end up pressing F10 a lot. Um, and I could, I could set, you know, different breakpoints at any point that I want. And then when I get bored and tired of hitting <laughs> F10, I can just hit this continue button uh, and it will go through and it will execute and all these properties uh, uh these kind of hidden properties in elements in revit you can also yep. find them with the lookup table right yes yeah, okay. yeah so um let's say i select uh let me go back to full screen and if i i'm going to click on just that piece of text if i go to add-ins i have the revit lookup installed right here so i can snoop current selection and now I can dig into it. So here I'm seeing that like, you know, under the hood view mm -hmm. of a text note. Yeah, so, so, you, so you might think like in, in Revit, all the parameters of any elements are only the one listed in the properties, yeah. but actually oh, no. there's all these things hidden in the exactly. hidden properties. Yeah. This is, I really like, you know, this is probably the add-in that I use the most mm -hmm. um, because it gives you that other view and it's a free add-in. So I, you, are curious about any of this stuff at all, it's worth getting that add-in just so you can see this, get this other view. Um, and I use it all the time because I'm, you know, text note type. Okay, I can click on that. Now I can look at all the properties of text note type. Let me see the parameters. So here are all the parameters that are available inside of a text note, uh, text note type. So it's super interesting that way. Um, okay, so I'm gonna close out of that. And the question came up about, okay, how would we, do, how do we make this into an application add-in? So we have, let me close that guy. Um, we have our command add-in right here. If I go into this app.cs, this is my app, basically the template for my application add-in. And you can see there's, there's two methods. One is on startup and the other is on shutdown. And there's nothing in here right now. So I'm gonna do a little bit of like the, um, the cooking show and I'm gonna pull out uh, the the code specifically for the add-in. And I'm going to, I'll just copy and paste and then I'll walk you through so you don't have to watch me actually type all of that in. So what we're gonna do though, is we're gonna create a uh, ribbon specifically and some buttons for our add-in. So I'm just gonna paste this in and I've got a couple of things. You can see it's giving me some errors. Uh, which are not nice, but that's okay. And now, where did you get that information? You uh, so copied it? This is, I had already written this earlier okay. today. So okay, yeah, okay. When, when we looked at the um, the version that I showed you with the mm -hmm. buttons, I'm gonna, this is actually the code that creates those buttons. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so we'll modify this for our, our purposes. Um, so the first thing, and again, on startup, when Revit launches, it's gonna read the add-in file here our add-in file is going to tell it to load the app class, which is right here. When we get to that app class, the first thing it's gonna do is it's gonna create a ribbon panel. And um, the ribbon panel, I give it a name and I'm using this, uh, The when I create the, or when I launch the app file, it's the variable it's passing is called this UI controlled application. So it's, when it launches that app file, Revit is passing a copy of the Revit application into this on startup. So I can use that now that I have that variable, I can use it to do things. In this case, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a Revit panel um, or a ribbon panel. So I can also, um, you had that question, Nicholas, if I wanted mm -hmm. to, if can I create an actual mm -hmm. uh, like, you know, 
tab. It's on tab. Yeah. Yeah. But let's do that. Um, what we're going to do instead of creating this as part of the add-ins, um, and under a section called Revit Pure Live, I'm just going to call it Tools. That will be the actually no the tab name. Sorry, let me back up. The tab name will be Revit Pure Live, and then the panel name is just going to be Tools. So this will create its own, you know, its own piece there on the on the interface. Yeah, so, so quite simple. It's not it's much more complicated. Simple. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So um, I've defined that. So here is my panel. The next thing I need to do is I need to basically just figure out some paths. So I have to figure out the path for the DLL file. Uh, the DLL file, like the code, doesn't really know where it's located. So I'm going to create a variable called car car assembly, and all this does is it says, it says, where am I? Tell me where I am. And this system.reflection.assembly.getExecutingAssembly.location is going to give me a file path to that DLL file. That's it. And it just answers that question, where am I? And that's going to give me the actual, the DLL itself. Now, mm -hmm. this next variable, current assembly path, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use another method called system IO path get directory name. And these are like standard libraries inside of C sharp. So nothing, you know, really complicated here. Um, I'm going to get the directory name of the DLL file. That's it. So that's just going to give me that, that path. So wherever, you know, I don't, sometimes I need to know the entire file. Other times I just need to know the directory path. And we'll use those in a second. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create, um, I'm going to start creating my buttons. So I need to, a button has two parts. There's first the push button data. And then once I define, that's basically all the properties that relate to that button. And then once I have defined the push button data, then I create the actual push button. So I had earlier, um, I had created four versions of my command. Uh, one that did text to upper, text to lower, uh, then I did some that were view specific. Right now, we're just going to do all text to upper because that's the, the command we have. Um, so I'm going to comment these guys out. So we'll create one button. Um, and when I create that push button data, I need to give that button a name. And then next to that, I need to um, show the text. I need to write out the text that's going to show up on the button. So there's the name of the button. And then in this case, I'm going to break this up into two lines. I use the slash R, um, and that will just separate the, the text that's displayed onto two lines. Next, I give it the path to the DLL file. And then I specify which command file I want to execute. So we're going to let me back up here. So our, oops, here we go. So our, um, this file is called test uh, Revit Pure Live, and then our command is just called command. So that, as soon as you press that button, it's going to execute this command file right here. So that creates the, the button data. Now I can, I'm going to comment these guys out. Um, now I can specify images for this. Now, in order to do this, I'm going to basically just pass a, a PNG file in, and I'm going to use that. So I do have to um, add one uh, reference here. So I'm going to just type using, let's see, system.windows.media. .imaging. So I'm adding a reference to a particular library that has to do with images and media. Um, I have to actually add a reference here to an external um, library called Presentation Core. This is a standard uh, Windows library, Presentation Core, and that contains all of the sort of image-related methods. Um, this stuff, like I don't, rem I don't retain all this information in my head. I use Google all the time, like. How do I add an image to yeah, yeah. do an add-in? And then it's like, oh, okay, I've done it before, but I don't do it every day. So um, I need to make a, a reference to that library. And if you've done any Python programming, this looks very similar. Um, so I'm calling in that library. And then I'm saying in my push button data, we're going to use a bitmap image. 
Um, and then I'm going to create basically a path to that image file. Um, I have that image file saved onto my local computer. So I'm going to get the assembly path, which is the location of our DLL file. And if I, I can show you where, and there's, there is a lot of different ways to do that. I'm doing this the easiest way. So this icon one image is located in the add-ins 2021 folder. So I just copied these in manually. So all this is going to do is it's going to give me a path directly to uh, that image file. So, and then lastly, once I have that defined, so I've defined my data, I've defined the image, I'm just going to create the button right here and I'm going to add it to the panel. So I say car panel dot add item. I add the push button data and that generates a push button uh, element. So really, I mean, I have a lot of additional lines. I can just delete these out of here and you can see that there's actually not much to mm. it. And there's certainly a lot more I can do in terms of adding like tooltips and, you know, mm. all kinds of different things. But in essence, there's really, you know, four, three or four lines that I'm using to, to create this. So if I go ahead and I hit start, we can take a look at it. So this is, you know, a, a very quick introduction. <laughs> um, you know, we can do you know, much longer. I've done sort of two day, three day long workshops. Specifically yeah, on. sure. Well, I guess while, while it's loading, we can have a look at the, the final questions. Yeah. Uh, Giovan asks uh, a top five list of helpful users for a custom app might be good. So I guess that would be the, the those you, you have on your website, right? You have a uh, art smarter. Yeah. Uh, added. I mean, I have an add-in that has, mm -hmm. you know, there's, um, oops, I did get programmer. So this is what happens when you get a, uh, I, I was doing this on the fly. Mm -hmm. um, oh, you know what? I didn't actually create the, the tab first. So I'm getting a, a runtime error here. So I will back out and we'll, we'll do this a little bit differently. Um, let me fix this. Sorry about that. No problem. So we'll just... So I won't show you how to create your own uh, tab yet. That'll be uh, part two, but let's do this again. We're going to make it just in the in the um, add-ins tab. We'll make a, a separate section specifically for for this tool, so you can see how it works. Um, but top five, I mean, there's you know I have tools that um, will create sheets. I have tools. Uh, let me see once we get this loaded. You know, if you look at, there's so many different things. Like I'm working on um, some add-ins now that deal a lot more with data and the data in the files and then interacting with Excel files um, and pushing and pulling data between those. I have um, add-ins that are looking at uh, automating, you know, creating model geometry. So adding switches, receptacles, mm -hmm. uh, sort of MEP elements into a model. Um, but if you think about doing that over an entire model with a couple clicks of a button, um, also like project startup is another good one. So automating us like how you would actually create and start a, a Revit project. Yeah. yeah, something I've heard is like, for example, here in Canada, we have a lot of uh, we use both uh, both units, you know, metric and imperial. Yeah. So, so I know that there's some scripts. Uh, I've heard animal scripts, but I guess you can do it with an add-in that automatically deletes like either. The, the metric families or the imperial families. Right, exactly, yeah. And, you know, if it's particularly for engineering firms, if you have mm -hmm. all of your disciplines in your template, you want to strip out, you know, everything but plumbing or you want electrical and structural and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so you could do that, you know. Uh, an another uh, couple of other questions. BD Thought says, add-in manager is the essential tool if you want to debug your add-in without restarting Revit each time. That's true, yeah. I, I haven't, I've been meaning to get that up and running on my Okay. Because that allows you to basically like do a, a hot reload okay. of your add-in while it's running. The, the issue um, when you don't use something like add-in um, manager is that when you open up Revit, it it locks down that DLL file. Mm -hmm. So when you change your code and then uh, build it again, it's going to try to copy over that DLL file, but Revit's going to lock it and it won't mm -hmm. allow you to overwrite it because it's already it's already in use. So uh, the add-in manager allows you to kind of slip new DLLs in there mm -hmm. while you know it's, it's without that lock. 
And Boris asks, if I create an add-in, can Visual Studio create the installer or can it only be so, done through the Autodesk store? Uh, no, you can actually, I do that all the time. I'll make my own installers. You can create a installer project mm -hmm. in Visual Studio. It's a specific um, project type. And then you can build the, an MSI file through Visual Studio. There's also like, there's other um, installer software you can use. Most of the time you have to, you know, you have to buy a license to it. I generally just use the, the built-in installer project. So now you can see we have our, our original version here, Revit Pure Live. It has our four tools. And then we have the one that we just created, Revit Pure Live 2. And so here's our, our, our image right here. And I can click on that. We have our breakpoints. I'll take this off. Um, I'll continue. And it's executing basically the same code that we did when we went through external mm -hmm. commands. So all of that, the, the app file, like their application add-in, all it does is it gives me a user interface to load that command add-in. That's, kind of, that's kind of it. All of the work is going to happen in the command add-in. You know, the, the app add-in part is just that user interface. Um, and again, a lot of times I develop things as a, you know, it's like two operations. One is develop the command add-in piece, get that working. That's sort of the logic. And that's the piece that interacts with the model. And then I'm going to, as a separate task, build out the user interface. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, de again, depending too on the complexity of the add-in, maybe there's forms involved and, you know, there's a lot of different steps. So we're looking at something you know, very simple just to show all the kind of working pieces and how they interrelate. Um, but all right. yeah, I mean, the sky's the limit in terms of like yeah. what sort of things you can add in. I mean, I have add-ins here that replace yeah. fonts, make sheets, copy views, you know, you mm -hmm. name it. Um, like there's, there's really very few limits to what you can do. Well, amazing, Michael. I, I do have a final question for you. Yeah. In, in a visual, uh, uh, what's the name of Visual Studio is yep. how do you know what is part of the Revit API and what is part of the, the C sharp programming language? Mm. Is it the color um, of the the color of the text? Not necessarily. No. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Let me yeah, there's really not a good um, a good way to differentiate it. I mean, other than there are certain things like a string, like if I want to create a piece of text, a string is is a basic C sharp mm -hmm. element. Um, mm -hmm. The Revit API is is really just a collection. For the most part, it's like elements, so like a wall element or you know a view. Things that are like specific to Revit, um, those are like the if you think of it in terms of like building blocks. But then a thing like a loop, a for each loop is that's a C sharp basic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, thing that's not API specific. Uh, but there's there's not necessarily a way to like filter out what's what's code that's C sharp specific and what's code that's a Revit API specific. Like this is a for each loop that mm -hmm. uses a text note, which is a Revit. You know, I can see when I hover over it, it says class autodesk.revit.db.textnote. Yeah, like okay, it, so it, it's basically by hovering. Yeah, that's probably gonna be the best way. Transaction, mm -hmm. you know, it's going to give me some information specific to transactions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's telling me that it belongs to autodesk.revit.db. All right. Well, yeah. uh, okay. Final question from Jovan. Could you speak briefly about how one will deploy to several users in one office, for example? Mm -hmm. um, probably the easiest way to do it would be to build an installer. Uh, so like real quick, if I were to go, I'm going to go up to solution in Visual Studio. I'm going to go to add. I'm going to add a new project. And the project type, I'm just going to do a quick search for installer, let's see, or setup project. So I can click on setup. I'll just call this installer. Um, and all this will do is now I have a, an installer. So I can copy in files that are going to be part of that installer. And then I can build that installer and I end up with a, an MSI file. So in this instance, um, you know, each user would need to run that installer to install the add-in. Um, and that's probably the easiest way in that it's going to put things in the right location. I could give the users the DLL file and the .add-in file and tell them mm -hmm. which location to put it in. They can do that as well. Um, and then, you know, when you get into really large offices, they have 
specific deployment strategies where mm -hmm. they can push out, you know, installers. But if you're talking, you know, five, 10 users, here's the installer, run it, you know, go on about your business. Well, amazing. I, I'm all riled up to start coding again. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's been a while. <laughs> yeah, we, we sort of scratched the, the surface here, but um, you know, I, I am not a program and architect by training. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I thought I would never be a programmer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it just takes some persistence, um, but it's certainly doable. And it's, you know, it's satisfying because the, the um, feedback is instant. It either works or it doesn't work. Yeah. So. Yeah, sure. So uh, anything you want to, to show or uh, talk about? Well, you can, people can visit your website, yeah. Art Smarter. So do you have, can people hire you as a consultant? Yeah, I mean, right now I'm doing, that's pretty much all the, the consulting work that I'm doing is, is developing custom add-ins. Mm -hmm. um, so I have, you know, clients where I'm working on a number of, a range of projects and a range of firms from architecture firms, uh, engineering firms, contractors. So, And uh, they can you know, reach you, can you show up your website so can sure. people yep. can show, can see? Let's see. <clears throat> so arcsmarter.com. Um, so you can, you know, I have articles in here specifically about automation, um, and you can contact me. My email address is michael at arcsmarter.com. Um, you can sign up for, I have, a, I send out a weekly a newsletter with, um, you know, productivity tips. I link to a lot of your stuff, Nicholas. Yeah. yeah thanks uh, by the yeah. way for uh, all your, so, uh, uh, you know, if you're interested in just hearing more about automation or just BIM in general, productivity. Um, this is kind of my my weekly. You know. Yeah, it's funny because my in my analytics, whenever you share my stuff, I can see the art smarter <laughs> bump in my. <laughs> That's always good to hear. Yeah, and and so yeah, the uh, I love I love your newsletter. It's uh, top five Thursday. It's called right. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So tomorrow, the next one comes out. All right, tomorrow, and yeah. uh, and the art community as well. That's true. Yeah. Like so that. another component. Um, mm -hmm. I have like a, a free community, oh, it looks like it's, here we go, uh, called ARC. So this is, um, it's just, you know, people in the industry who are interested in technology, um, you can, it's free to join. So you can go here, you know, it's kind of like a forum, but a little, it's like a combination between, you know, a forum and a social media site. Uh, but, you know, there's, uh, it's not owned by Facebook or anything like that. So yeah we don't, we don't share data which, which but, is good yeah uh, yeah um you know and again it's just a community of people particularly uh, been helpful since for the most part you know we haven't been going to conferences or, or yeah um really networking that way so you're welcome here yeah well cool yeah. so any last word anything else you, you want to share i'm or... good thank you for for having me this was really fun um, yeah it was great yeah, it's it's a lot of information uh if you you know try it out let me know if you have any questions. Um, there are a bunch of good tutorials. I I have offered um, classes specifically through Arc Smarter mm -hmm. on C Sharp. I haven't done one in a while. I, I'm planning to do one this year, uh, but I don't have a date or anything yet. Um, so, okay, and and so sign the, up for the newsletter and you'll find out. Yeah, <laughs> and, and so the, the the first step for would be to learn C Sharp, right? I would recommend, yeah, mm -hmm. yep. Um, and you can learn C Sharp as you're learning the Brevity API, but um, the book that I referenced, this one right here, is a great, I, this was perfect for me because, again, it's a short oh, book. Let me show it again. Yeah, yeah. there you go. You can, um, you know, you can pick it up and it's kind of easy to follow examples. And that will mm -hmm. give you a, a point of entry into C Sharp. Mm -hmm. Then on top of that is learning the Revit API. Um, but that's, you know, that's doable as well. All right. So... Thanks everybody for joining in and thanks to, to Michael. Make, make sure to visit uh, Michael's website at uh, arcsmarter.com uh, and see you next week for the next show. Thanks, Michael. Thank so, you. Bye. See you.